try and do a sort of quick tour de force through my presentation within my 15 um, minutes allotted. And if, if there are any problems with, uh, you know, volume or whatever, Bell, perhaps you can just shout, shout out. So I'll, I'll kick off now. So I'm Martin Charter from the Center for Sustainable Design at University for the Creative Arts. We were set up, the center was set up in 1995 and uh, we focus on sustainable innovation and product sustainability across a series of sectors. We're particularly involved um, in, as a partner in the Circular Ocean Project, as Bell mentioned, that is looking at essentially the recycling and of uh, fishing nets, uh, ropes and, uh, and uh, components into uh, the collection, recycling, and, and development of products um, from uh, fishing nets, ropes, and, and components. What we've identified so far is broadly four, uh, six types of product service um, combinations, and we're exploring some new ideas in terms of business models. But in practice, um, We've identified uh, there are already uh, organizations uh, uh, completing specialist services around the repair of fishing nets and ropes, particularly on va larger volume nets. There's, there's already by some of the fishermen in the communities, they already uh, extend the life of their nets through their own repair services. Um, we are uh, exploring various examples of reuse of the fishing nets into sports nets, i.e. football goals, maybe cricket nets even, uh, golf nets, etc. Um, also, we've identified uh, companies in the distribution chain, like Novia, who are involved in reverse distribution, um, Econile through Aquafil, um, who have their uh, D and then repolymerized fiber that is going into a range of products uh, that we probably all know uh, uh, going particularly into clothing, carpets, etc. But there are a range of other products that have been developed outside the Aquafil Econile um, you know, supply chain. Um, and one area that we sort of recently identified at our own project meeting. Um, particularly given our research and the work at uh, uh, feasibility study work we've been looking at in ports. There seems to be quite mature supply chains around the nylon, but it's less clear on the uh, the uh, on PE, etc. So I'd really like to hear some feedback on that after I finish. Um, what we've also identified is uh, uh, is fuel. Uh, various companies now starting to look at nets and roads polyplastic nets and ropes into fuel. Um, so what I'm also looking at at a port level is, is how we develop better in innovation systems at a local level to try and identify entrepreneurs, connect them up with say maker spaces or fab labs and maybe universities or colleges to get good ideas maybe to reutilize the nets into products to the market. So this is one area we're starting to look at the idea of local innovation systems or eco-innovation systems in ports. And part of what we see also in a broader set of issues that are relevant to this area but a broader part of a movement that I'm seeing is this whole area of bottom-up innovation. I'm calling it reindustrialization 1.0, much more decentralized, that has the um, power to be more low carbon and more circular. This is a new range of makers, modifiers and fixers emerging who, who really want to, you know, as it says, make, modify and fix products. Um, even new terms emerging, fixperts for example, but basically it appears after 208 out of necessity but also groups of motivated people really wanting to start to make products again. And we saw some of these trends, you know, hitting wide and other, th other um, key influential magazines. This has all been driven by a range of mega trends that includes massive access to information. We can find, you know, there's huge amounts of information we can access at the click of a button. But also, particularly if we think about making, modifying, fixing products, you can go on the, on the web now and see Vimeo and YouTube videos that can show you 
making your fixing videos that to give you the idea of what to do. Not necessarily a perfect video, but it's really influential, I believe, in helping the process of making, modifying, fixing. Also, again, compared all this is compared to say ten years ago. We've got Web 2.0, Facebook, Twitter, more of a culture and certain groups of sharing information and ideas. Uh, more growing use of crowdsourcing, but also crowdfunding. Crowdfunding before 2008 and the global crash didn't really exist, but now we're getting examples here, for example, of uh, Flowhive, the company that developed a, um, a tappable uh, beehive. You tap the honey direct from the beehive. They is a, 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 a father and son, mature father and uh, son. They raised 13.2 million US dollars. 17,000% um, over their target. Essentially an idea that may not have made it through a traditional bank, but now, uh, you know, with the right, you know, uh, concept, the right video, the right uh, access, if you like, uh, or outreach, uh, we can get, uh, you know, there are ways to fund things that we couldn't do in the past. Also, we've got open sourcing, uh, more open sourcing starting to emerge of, 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 pro, uh, of uh, designs and patents. We came across an example, not again in this space, but just for the example, of a hacker space that had a baby stroller that was brought in. Uh, the guys open sourced the component for the stroller, and then they printed the component, repaired the product, and it went out of the door. So there may well be similar applications in print sections of nets maybe. We So also Nike and others who've started to uh, diffuse some of their patents, particularly around uh, clothing products and uh, uh, and footwear, green, green materials. Also this broader open, open innovation approach emerging. Uh, hacks, jams, uh, etc. Started in the area of coding but moving into other areas. Also importantly places and spaces that are starting to emerge to enable people to make, modify and fix. So these are typically maker spaces, fab labs, repair cafes. Important point is again compared to 10 years ago, these sorts of things didn't uh, exist, but these are now places where people can get together, can share ideas of information, work on equipment, build prototypes, etc. And what we found from our initial research in the northern periphery area is in some of the port areas or the facilities in the port areas, there are examples of, of, of these places and spaces existing. So how can you, would, might, one might utilize that in terms of, uh, you know, providing nets and ropes, offering to guys you know, the opportunity, this is a feedstock to produce products. Other areas that are emerging, Goldfinger Factory, this is in London, and, and Remakery, again, these are places, they're different sorts of organizations where maybe they're a mix of a cafe, a training facilitate, an incubator, but with a strong green theme. Um, people reutilizing, say, construction waste products into, into products and creating businesses. So there's a change going on there. We're also seeing 3D printing emerging, uh, prices is going down. We've done some very specific work, which I can refer you back to if you're interested, looking at the potential application of 3D printing to waste nets uh, and ropes. Uh, we, me and my colleague, did a very small piece of very applied research, and we found that um, uh, that uh, we set up an experiment where she used some uh, nylon net uh, and filaments and then try to do some 3D printing. We could do it, but what we learned from that exercise that nylon absorbs a lot of water. So you have to dry the, the nylon nets before putting it into the 3D printing process. We found one specific company um, in the southwest of England who is called Fishy Filaments and they are starting to use uh, um, waste filament from nets and ropes 3D printing. Localized uh, localized networks emerging, 3D hubs. This is, uh, you know, basically you can go onto this, you can see other people that hold, hold 3D uh, printers. Maybe you can share work, you know, time on these. Uh, 
And lastly, the advent of local, what I call local DIY machines. So these are uh, 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 these are low machines, often um, much more localized that that can help uh, reutilize um, waste plastic. So by fusing or using plastic waste bottles into construction products. Polyfloss, this is something from the Royal College of Art. They've used the candy flush process to fluff up uh, uh, materials that maybe you could use in insulation. Uh, Better Future Factory, again, they're experimenting particularly with uh, waste bottles and 3D printing. And Dave Hackins and Precious Plastics, he's totally open sourced the blueprint for six machines that effectively you can put uh, waste plastic in the front and out of the end uh, will pop out products. Not as simple as that, but I'm all of these areas I'm looking at could we, you know, feed in waste nets and ropes into this. Also, the emergence of uh, new, uh, uh, you know, uh, smaller organisations like Burio that they want a good business, but sustainability is key. So again, Method's an example of that. Method uh, was acquired by Ecova. Basically, they broke their ideas into, they were concerned about ocean plastic, and uh, they, rather than donate to a cause, they worked within Ecova to create, you know, uh, bottles for Ecova with the waste ocean plastics. Again, getting that message out to the retailer about the issue. So it's, it's campaigning through the products, if you like. So just in, in the, I'll go through this very quickly, uh, a few examples from Circular Ocean about some of the things we've been doing. Uh, within the project, we're particularly focused on the green enterprise uh, and eco-innovation aspects, and I would say very quickly, and we can come back to that if we have enough time, the areas that we're looking at in the future, we'll be talking to Belle and, and, and Chris, are uh, particularly around a global competition, we're going to look for new solutions. We're also able to offer within the northern periphery area free support to SMEs that are interested in developing products. And we're also actively looking for examples of products for a, a small booklet that we're going to produce on, the, on various products from Nets and Ropes. Uh, again, I can go through this in detail offline if people are interested. So what I just highlighted is two recent things we did. We set up one called the, the Net Hack Challenge, where we got eight challenges about the reuse of nets. Um, and we presented this to a design to, to seven to eight design teams who then took on board working through presentations of very, you know, a creative process and uh, doing research to then develop concepts that they then basically applied to nets and ropes. So we went through a creative session in the morning, nets and ropes were delivered. They then went off and made products from the nets and ropes. So this is uh, basically a, uh, a cushion, in effect, um, that was all made from the nets and ropes. This was a series of products, uh, toys for the beach, also plant pots using nets and ropes, a universal um, strap, a football net, um, various items that are under the heading of something called the Copenhagen Kitchen that included tiles. Uh, lighting products and other items. Also, uh, another item which was in effect a bench, uh, and another one was adaption of a litter picker uh, into a child's picker to, for picking up uh, beach litter. So, in that process, it was creative, but it was also making and modifying. And we're going to be running another one of a, an event like this in Iceland. And just moving very quickly, because I know time is ticking on, we also just re very recently ran something called the, the, the Chem Hack, where we looked at the whole problem area of the anti-foulance, particularly on aquaculture nets, um, which include a lot of copper, waxes, and unknown uh, um, chemical compounds. And this, as far as we understand, is actually creating problems in the recycling. Uh, good quality nylon, but difficult to re recycle. So we had a, a, a challenge set up to, amongst a bunch of environmental chemists to come up with new solutions. And again, we worked through a, a different process. So this is more of a process challenge. And they came up with a series of different, two different solutions to look at the washing of the nets. 
and these are presented. These will be open sourced on our website over the next few weeks. I think realistically, probably after after Christmas. But anyway, thank you very much for your time, and that's it. Martin, thank you ever so much, and you're bang on time. We have about a minute or so. If there's any questions from the audience they would like to ask, or if not, Martin has his information up, so you could continue the conversation offline. Is there any questions from the audience? Did you hear it? Oh, Joel has a question. Sorry, that was in response to, did you hear it? Yeah, um, I'd like to connect <laughs> and maybe ask those questions at a, at, a, at a later date rather than sure. uh, uh, drop this off a little bit. Yeah, it's, that's some sure. great work. Yeah? Sure, no problem, no problem. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so do. what I'll do now um, is I will hand over... Oh. I will hand over um, to Gideon Jones. Um, Gideon, when you're ready. Hi, everybody. Um, just a quick check that my mic and sound is working okay? Yep, I can hear you good. Wonderful. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I'll dive right in. Um, it's great to be here with everybody. For anyone I didn't have a chance to meet in Miami, uh, my name is Gideon Jones. I'm working with a group called the Emerald Sea Protection Society here in Vancouver, Canada. Um, focused on kind of recovery of materials, but um, doing some work as well within the building evidence group of Triple GI. So I'm going to just run through our kind of uh, working plan for the year, since the number of things we've achieved in the last month isn't huge, though we have some ongoing progress. Um, what we have done is put together, a kind of, we've kind of distilled down a lot of the discussion we had at the AGM um, into some hopefully very clear deliverables. Although that process is still kind of ongoing, uh, what I'd like to do today is just run through that working plan just to kind of uh, introduce it to everyone, um, especially those who perhaps didn't hear the initial version of it at the AGM. And uh, yeah, hopefully as we have these meetings going through the year, uh, gradually I can point to these things uh, and say that they're done. So one of our huge tasks for this year is harmonizing data collection. So one of the things the group worked on last year was reaching out to lots of different groups to get information about the type and distribution of ghost gear around the world, um, which is a huge project, obviously, and we made some really good progress in that. And one of the things we identified is that we're capturing a few different types of data. So we're setting out right at the beginning of this year to um, really refine exactly what uh, criteria, attributes, and just general data types we need uh, and are most likely to get from these different groups around the world. Um, this is stuff you're all familiar with, kind of um, size of mesh and nets, uh, beyond nets, what type of thing uh, is being discarded or lost, uh, just so that we can get a really uniform uh, database that is queryable, useful, powerful, um, but something that people all around the world can plug data into. Um, so we're, we're right in the process of developing that refined um, model of data capture. Um, that is underpinning several other things the group is going to be working on this year. Um, essentially all different types, um, all different takes on the same thing. So we're going to be developing this uh, Triple GI data portal. So this is one of the ways that people are going to be able to contribute data about lost gear. So once we've decided finally exactly what types of information we need from people, we want to develop tools to make it as easy as possible for all sorts of different groups around the world to bring that information to us and share it so that um, we can in turn share it back with other people. Um, so one of the ways people are going to be able to share this with us is develop and distribute this Triple GI data portal. It's going to be a web-based tool that allows identification um, if there is an existing one, but it needs refining based on this new and updated criterion. It needs um, a few extra features adding to it, like bulk data upload um, from pre-existing databases and possible translation of those databases into these new formats. So that's all um, all going to go into the relaunch of this Triple GI data portal. We're hoping to be doing that right at the beginning of 2017. We're looking at end of February. 
um, I think is our provisional working date for having that ready. In a similar vein, you can probably kind of see that we're working on this model of having a single data repository, but we're looking at having multiple front ends feeding into the same repository, as I mentioned. So one of the other front ends is going to be a mobile app. Um, again, this is building on, on a lot of work that was done last year. There's some apps that are already out there doing great work. Uh, there was an awful lot of work done in the Fish Hackathon last year where lots of different uh, open source uh, groups came together to develop apps that could report on lost gear. So there's a huge amount of work that just needs to be taken to the final step of actually refining, again, bringing into line with these updated criterion that we're deciding on at the minute, uh, and actually publishing and launching and putting out there. And for that, we're, we're aiming for World Ocean Day, June 8th. We're hoping we'll obviously be doing some internal testing and we'll probably be calling on members of the Triple GI to help us out with that a little bit. But yeah, so as we get towards the middle of the year, hopefully we're going to have these multiple front ends to gathering um, quite a wide range of uh, data about lost gear. Uh, and that really ties into our general, uh, in terms of what building evidence does, this increased data working point. We have fourth down on the left here. Um, that's sort of what we do in general. We, we identified it as a something we wanted to achieve, obviously, at the AGM is increased data, but specifically we have these two different uh, ways we want to increase data. One is relating to everything I've just spoken about, so increasing the amount of reporting on ghost gear, be it from recreational um, participants or fishermen or other groups that are doing larger scale overviews. We want to just be able to create a place where all that data can come together, but also increasing uh, literature and research into the problems surrounding this that relate to the work all of us are doing. Um, so these are the two ways we're hoping to increase data. This is obviously an ongoing um, objective of ours all the time, but we have a few milestones spread throughout the year, like certain volume of data collected, certain numbers of papers collected and things like that. Um, and then another thing we're working on is sharing evidence. So that, again, ties into everything we've just spoken about, but we're hoping to build and develop uh, web platforms that allow really powerful and effective sharing of materials. I think this can apply a lot within the Triple GI, but we also want to provide it um, you know, outward-facing to the world of anyone who wants to get hold of this information. Um, and that's going to include things like if they're... At the minute, we have papers grouped in kind of categories, which are very useful, but maybe papers relate to two or three or four different aspects of the problem. We want to try and build these tools that allow you to filter and search so that you can say that perhaps you want things relating to ingestion and population decline, and you'll get a series of paper and data, papers and data that relate to both those topics, which might be uh, a useful um, tool. Um, so yeah, again, ongoing, that's, that's more like July, um, hopefully, for that being ready to go after we've increased all data collection earlier in the year. Um, we've got this general thing we're working on, working group best practices, it was talked about a lot at the AGM, but um, we've, we've got all these like big dreams of keeping our momentum up, we've got quite, quite ambitious goals this year, so uh, we're really trying to go through a process of assigning members of the working group to uh, specific tasks, getting specific deliverables and specific deliverable dates. Uh, we may not always need them, of course. In fact, we almost certainly won't meet some of them, but we're trying to keep it realistic. And right now, what we're working on is, um, in this first month after the AGM, or I guess it's a little, a little bit more than that, but uh, really going through the process of clearly outlining our goals for the year and assigning these members who are going to be most effective to that. So we're hoping to have a call um, within the next couple of weeks, actually, within the working group to, to finalize that process. And then the last four things that are here on the slide of things we're hoping to achieve this year, these are uh, specific research topics that we're fortunate enough that members within our working group have as either part of their PhDs or within their organizations, they're focused on really discovering more data about this. So this, these, these range from publishing papers in this field to collating data. So I'll go through them quite quickly, but um, the first one here is 
uh, looking at the links between illegal unlicensed unreported um, fishing and lost gear. Um, that's going to be a look at every, all the available data that's out there um, and publishing uh, an overarching view of, of that data. Uh, then we're looking to compile data sets on ingested gear. Again, uh, doing a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of valuable data out there in the world, um, but it's maybe a little disparate, it's a little different in type, so we're trying to find it all, uh, harmonize it, and where possible, write kind of um, things that tie it all together. Uh, and finally, uh, investigating port waste reception facilities. So it's going to be a really interesting project that looks at kind of how distance from effective um, recycling and just places that lost, uh, not lost gear, but, but derelict gear can be disposed of how a kind of being far away from effective facilities perhaps increases the likelihood of that gear re-entering um, the oceans. So yeah, these are our objectives for the year. Um, we have basically begun work on all of them slightly. Uh, none of them are complete, but as we go through the year, we'll start ticking these off. And um, next week, I believe we have hopefully one of the final calls on harmonizing data collection. And next time we talk, I'll be able to tell you that's been done. Um, I think I've got about 20 seconds left, so if you want to any questions. Um, Gideon, thank you. Thank you so much. And if there are any questions, please unmute yourself. I know that I will certainly be putting myself forward to test that data app. That sounds, that sounds really very exciting. Was there any questions from the audience? You can either type them or unmute your mic to ask. I had a question. Um, this is Joan. Can you, you mentioned, Gideon, that the last four things on the working group agenda were things that were pe people were already taking on. Can you say who is doing them? Yes, great question. I can. Um, it's, I can't say it off the top of my head. One second. So I know that Kelsey is working on the Port Waste Reception Facilities. Um, I'm scrolling frantically through the more detailed version of our work plan. Um, I know that in just uh, ingestion work is done by Kirsten. Um, Kelsey is also working on the governance um, issues. And Kelsey is also working on the link between IUU and gear loss. So Kelsey doing her PhD in a lot of these things, um, but also Kirsten working on uh, the ingestion work. Thanks. Wonderful. Is there any other questions? No? Okay, then um, we'll move swiftly on to Grant from the Best Practice Working Group. Thanks ever so much, Gideon. All righty. Can, uh, can you hear me, Bill? Yep, absolutely. You're coming through pretty slow. Perfectly. Um, they're perfect. I, for, thanks for uh, inviting me to present and inviting our uh, working group to present on the webinar here. I think this is a good idea, and already I've learned a lot, so thank you. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Grant Galland. I live in Washington, D.C. and work for the Pew Charitable Trusts um, on tuna conservation and other fisheries issues. And I am the new chair of the Best Practices and um, Policies in, um, Working Group here for Triple GI. And today I'm just going to really quickly present some updates um, that we already have since the AGM and then give you all a uh, um, an idea of what we're going to be doing over the next couple of months and then maybe some more ambitious ideas for the towards the end of the year before the next AGM. Um, as Just as a reminder, we presented in October in Miami the um, best practices framework, which we worked on with help from Tim Huntington of Poseidon Aquatic Resources Limited. Um, and and we sort of had some agreement, some early consensus in the room that um, we wanted to have the members, the Triple GI members, have one final chance to look at that document and, and give any remaining comments that they might have, and that then we could uh, take a few additional steps, which I'll describe in a minute, on, on our way to finalizing it and uh, eventually publicizing it. Um, and we also, there was some consensus in the room that the working group would sort of be the 
um, the expert group inside of Triple GI to decide when the document is quote unquote final, although we agreed as well that it'll be a living document, but um, basically deciding when that document should be something that we start to um, publicize, spread around to, to contacts outside of the initiative and, um, and begin to gather endorsements for. So uh, that sort of falls to our group. Um, the group, by the way, is growing a bit. Uh, we had about five or six active members last year and about double that amount this year. Um, Lynn continues as the coordinator, which really means she knows most of the work, let's be honest. Um, I just talk and um, and I think we're moving forward nicely. So so you all on the call um, certainly saw a message from Bell the, the week after, maybe two weeks after the AGM. Um, with an invitation to provide your comments, and we did receive some comments. The, the deadline was last Friday, December 2nd, and we, um, in typical fashion, received a bunch of comments in, in the last couple of days, but that was to be expected. And um, I can report that it was uh, all very useful. It's, it's, um, I've worked on these sorts of things before, and we often get all sorts of comments back that we frankly can't use. Um, and in this case, I was just, I was really excited to read through the comments because frankly, everyone from, from every person will improve the framework and, and we'll be incorporating almost all of your comments, those of you on the call that, that submitted things, thank you very much. Um, we had our first working group meeting yesterday from since the AGM where we discussed those comments and, and discussed um, how to move forward. We'll, we'll now be um, gathering all of those into one document, which we'll share, share back with Tim next week. Um, Tim will incorporate all of our feedback into his, his um, final draft, which he will have to us by the end of the month, although um, in typical Poseidon fashion, I imagine that it will come much sooner. Um, Tim tends to th turn things around quite quickly. And then we will have a, a quote-unquote final version, which we will take to our next round of consultation. Um, before I get to that, though, I just wanted to mention that there has been some discussion um, amongst the working group and with the World Animal Protection folks about um, the need to provide some shorter summary documents um, and, and some other shorter useful documents, which we'll be doing over the next six weeks as well, because we want to pre prepare those before any um, external expert consultation. So those. Um, uh, just as a reminder, the document is set up by stakeholder group so that the fishermen and the um, gear manufacturers and the retailers and the um, NGOs all have uh, a, a section or chapter of the framework that they can flip right to for their um, ideas, but um, we were uh, recommended by some, some folks that it might be useful to think of something um, without rewriting the whole document to think about how we can put together short summaries for different gear types because um, fats, for example, or traps and pots or gill nets are spread out amongst all of the, the advice is spread out amongst all of the stakeholder groups rather than being able to simply flip to one page and read about fads. So we've um, early on decided to write three two-page summaries, no more than two pages. One will be on, on fads, one on gill nets, and one on traps and pots. Those were the three gear types that were identified early on uh, in our process as being um, the most impactful to ghost fishing and ghost gear issues. So we're going to summarize those three. And then finally, at Joan's recommendation, uh, another idea that we really liked is to have a quick one-page checklist for each stakeholder group um, so that someone can just print off a one-pager and say, are we doing these 10 things or are we not? Um, so that's something else we're going to be working on. All of those things, the, the large document of, of several dozen pages, the three two-pagers, and the series of checklists are all things that we're going to send out for um, external consultation. And um, that'll be the folks in the seafood industry on, at, the, at the retail level, but also fishing um, organizations, trade organizations, um, groups of folks that have policy um, advisors or, or employees that can take some time to, to look at um, some or all of those documents and, and give us an idea of just how uh, realistic it is and what will be required before we can expect some sort of uh, endorsement. Um, that's going to happen in the end of January um, with, with hopefully comments back by March and then 
um, a slow rollout of the document, as we mentioned back in Miami, at the different seafood shows throughout the spring and early summer, so that by midsummer, um, we expect everything to be finalized and publicly available and with the Triple GI logo all over it. So um, that's really the plan for the framework. And then um, the second main objective for our work plan is to figure out how to incorporate the framework or some pieces of it into um, one of the one or more of the um, pilot projects that are that are going to be happening with the third working group, and, and um, that's something that we've admittedly decided to hold off on on really planning until we figure out what our availability and what our timeline will be after the framework is finalized. So that's something we'll be thinking about over the next couple of months, but um, I don't have much to report to you yet. And then finally, um, I just wanted to mention that the, the group is officially best practices and policy, um, informing policies. So we've um, decided to have about 10 or 15 minutes on each of our calls over the next year to uh, allow members of the group to share any sort of non-best practices um, policies or projects that they are working on through their organizations or individually, and that that might be a really um, good good opportunity for folks that aren't on the working group but who might be involved in this sort of work to um, share with the group, um, you know, on a monthly basis or just to pass along to me or Lynn for us to share. Um, and I think I'm running low on time here, but if there's um, any final thoughts I would just like to leave you with, we're um, struggling a bit with our definition of gear marking, and that's something that um, that the group and really the best practices seems to be continuing to um, refer to throughout the entire document. And um, so, you know, I'm going to put together an email, or our working group will put together an email to, to share with the wider group on um, just what to do about gear marking and this is another thing that was um, that was an idea from Joan that we need to be careful on on how much we rely on gear marking and how much um, we how careful we are with the definition of what gear marking requires and what sorts of um, policies um, punitive or otherwise would be required for gear marking to become an effective mitigant of ghost fishing. So that's something that I'll um, ask you all to think about over the next little while and then I'll probably put to the steering committee as well um, ahead of their next meeting. But um, those, those are our thoughts for the, for the next several months and um, we have folks identified to take each of those tasks and I think we're uh, in pretty good shape. So thank you. Thank you so much Grant. I'll open it to the floor if there's any questions in the last minute or so that we have. Or if Grant's got a way he's got free and there's no questions, um, I can move on and pass it over to Rachel. Grant, thank you so much. There's been so much progress from the group. And um, it's really exciting to hear about the deliverables that will be happening in 2017. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Rachel. OK. And you're just transferring, I guess, to, to my screen? Perfect. Uh, um, so I'll click through for you. Okay, I'll just let you know where to go next. Uh, so everyone, uh, if uh, we haven't met before, my name's Rachel Merritt. Um, I'm based in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, and I work for a company called Archipelago Marine Research. I'm a co-coordinator on the Catalyze and Replicate Solutions group with uh, Christina. And so I think I'll just start here if you want to go ahead a slide for me. All right. Um, basically, I just made a little list of things I want to cover um, today with you guys. Uh, we really wanted to sort of build off that momentum that we had in Florida and really kickstart a lot of our um, goals for the year. So I'll go through them all with you here because we're going to be going through them throughout the presentation, so not to repeat myself. So you can uh, please skip. So. Um, Basically, one thing we talked about as a as a whole in in Florida was to develop um, basically a directory of all the members that we have within the the Triple GI, uh, their expertise, where they are, um, contact information, etc. And we wanted to make this available uh, to 
the broad group, and then uh, I think the decision was to, to be able to put it online so that people going to the Triple GI website could see who's involved and maybe source out people that they might turn to for expertise with maybe projects they've got going on, etc. So just a little screen capture for you here um, so you can see what it looks like. Uh, we got everyone from our working group just to fill in a quick little uh, blurb under these uh, categories. You can uh, just see it there and so we just thought um, if any of the other groups um, want to borrow that they're definitely allowed to use a little template and hopefully we could get everyone uh, completed for the whole group so that's been completed. Next. Uh, we've been uh, working on our working plan which uh, it's all been finalized thanks to Christina and won't go through obviously everything with you we don't have the time but um, just some of the key objectives and, and what's been going on. So in our first objective, we wanted um, solutions projects coordinated across our three working groups and information to support the projects available to the participants. Um, basically, this kind of really second working year of, of the organization, we wanted to be able to use every working group's um, you know, expertise in projects and rolling that into the solutions project. So uh, part of the work that's been going on has been uh, coordinating with the other working groups, uh, specifically right now uh, with the best practices group with the best practices framework that they've developed and looking at the data gathering and how we can incorporate that into uh, our application process sort of document so that um, people proposing projects will basically be able to put those elements in and the best practices group could use that information. And we also want to make the info on the projects uh, available and present them at the webinars and then have them available on the website so that people um, outside of the Triple GI know projects that we're supporting and what's going on and then anyone obviously within the Triple GI can see that and if they are involved in the organization or a a company that would maybe potentially want to be involved with those projects, they have access to that information. And next. And you can go ahead, Bill. And a couple more points under there too is the um, project proposal criteria and our scoring methods. Uh, we wanted to share that with everyone within the Triple GI, which uh, we did in November, so that everyone knows exactly the outline of, of the information we're looking for in a proposal and exactly how we're scoring it. So that's been completed. And also the production of guidance materials will be uh, something we're working on throughout the year and our goal is to have all of these uh, completed uh, sometime in July. So these are basically uh, guidance materials produced to um, outline best practice methods related to solutions projects. So some of the ones we want to cover are locating lost gear, recovery of lost gear, recycling. And we do have leads within the working group, uh, or our working group, sorry, that are taking those on. And so that's just going to be an ongoing project for the year. And skip. In uh, objective two, how we wanted to have uh, at least eight new solutions projects um, supported this year with the goal of having a minimum of four of those being in developing nations. If we can have more, uh, that's even better. And so to tackle this, we did need to establish uh, a project proposal review board. And so that has done, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information in the next slide here, but um, worked really hard to, to get a group together uh, to be evaluating these uh, proposals and then giving uh, a green light uh, or not to the secretariat and the steering committee. Uh, we needed to work on uh, liaising with the secretariat and the steering committee about our funding strategy and sources and then being able to provide the information on solution projects uh, seeking the funding. So uh, within those uh, projects we are working on outreaching both internally and externally so that we can definitely reach our target of having a minimum of four of those projects in developing countries. You can skip. And just go ahead. Oh, perfect. Thanks. And so, Adapter 3, 
uh, identify information gaps required uh, to catalyze and replicate solutions in different areas. So we wanted to tackle that in two ways, one by uh, outreaching to educational institutions to build links to support our work and also to engage with educational institutions on actual projects which could benefit the aims of our obviously the working group and the triple GI as a whole. So something will be has started and will continue throughout the year, but we'll be able to give some more updates probably at a further webinar on that. Skip. So within the solutions project, I should actually call it review board. I have approval in here, but uh, second thought, I should change that. But uh, we do have eight members. Um, from the solutions working group, we have Burton, Cram, Joan, uh, Ricky, and Pascal. And we wanted to definitely have a, a broader range of members. So at the moment, we do have Denise from the Building Evidence, uh, Natalie and Mike from the uh, Best Practices Working Groups. And we have right now had one initial meeting with them uh, to discuss how uh, the approval process has went for the two projects that are in sort of the middle of that right now. Just gonna skip ahead there. So right now we've had um, two projects that are sort of like in the process of the, uh, the approval at different stages. Uh, Fathoms Free has a project that they would like to do in Southwest England. I don't have time to probably uh, go through the projects with you, but uh, they do have a lot of what I call sub-projects within this big project from beach cleanups to, to, to diving cleanups. Um, education outreach, working with the uh, fishing industry, recycling, so it's a, a quite a massive project. And they completed their application and it has been reviewed and uh, we've had really good feedback and so basically we just asked them to do a few minor tweaks and then when that's completed we'll submit that to the steering group. And the second one is in a developing nation through plastics in Saldana Bay in South Africa. And it's a sort of cradle to cradle recycling program. And they have submitted their letter of interest to our project uh, review board. It's had positive feedback. So at this point, we've asked them to complete the actual uh, application for scoring and just give us some more details that we need with uh, the budget, et cetera. So skip ahead. I run on top. So uh, through our initial um, projects that have been submitted, we've gotten feedback from both the people applying and from our uh, review board. And it has led us to the conclusion that we need to have a terms of reference for the, the review board. And this included uh, being able to define the roles and responsibilities of those members, uh, just because it is a volunteer position and we want everyone to know what's sort of expected and, and what we need from them. Uh, we're basically looking at reviewing projects on a monthly basis so that we get answers back in a timely fashion. And we don't overwhelm the reviewers uh, by having, say, quarterly and they have 10 or 20 to review. Um, we do have eight members, so we are aiming to have 60% of the review board score each project before recommendation to the steering group. Why not 100 is just because some people may not be available. They might actually uh, be involved in the project, so they can't review it. So we thought 60% would be sufficient. And then we are looking to the steering group to help us with defining any conflict of interest. So if um, anyone's involved in projects, what exactly is a conflict of interest versus maybe knowing the project people, and uh, that could be a positive aspect and not necessarily a conflict of interest. And lastly, uh, we want to be able to define to project proposal, uh, so pros or sorry, uh, what exactly support from the Triple GI means. So uh, we are coming up with basically um, that we can provide them with a letter of support that they can take to other funders um, or approval from other groups. And um, we want to be able to, to match them with uh, funders, but letting them know that we don't necessarily have a huge pot of money that sits there but that we will invest the time and the resources to help them find the funders and connecting them with a, a liaison within uh, our working group. And I think that was my last slide. Yep, that's your last slide and you're bang on time. Thank you and sorry for the slight lag in the, um, the presentation. Oh, that's okay. Thanks, Rachel. No uh, Martin has a question about cradle to cradle um, and a definition around this in the chat. So I don't know if you want to respond or other people within the solutions working group want to respond back 
to Martin on chat and then we can move on to the steering group presentation. Sure. Uh, if you want, uh, Martin, uh, I could actually send you some information on all the details of the project if you want, if that makes it easier, just because it is quite comprehensive. Great. That would be a good idea. Um, okay. And Martin has left his email within the chat, so I'm sure you guys can get in touch offline. Um, sure. And that leads me to handing over to Joel, who'll be giving us a steering group update. So over to you, Joel. Everybody hear me? Yep, you're coming through fine. Okay, great. Sorry, my computer froze, so I've had to download the app and open it on my iPad, so I wasn't sure how, how well that would work. So, um, Thank you, everybody. Um, it, now, that, now that I know everyone can hear me, um, I'll try to keep it. Uh, I'll try to keep it short in the interest of time. But uh, uh, we're aware uh, the steering committee, our steering group, is aware that uh, the steering group was a bit nebulous before we had a talk about that in Miami. Obviously, um, and as in, as the uh, Triple GI as an initiative was pretty new, um, that's not necessarily surprising. Uh, because nobody was quite sure what uh, direction it was going to take. Um, it was still quite a fledgling group. I think that everybody in the working groups, however, has done a tremendous job uh, over the first real official year of work. So um, kudos to everybody for doing that. And I think uh, now that we have the working groups, uh, they seem to have, and as uh, with the presentations we've just heard, they have their own directions um, uh, pretty solid. Uh, the steering group, I think, can focus on um, how best to assist the working groups with the work that they have, and also how to standardize um, some more aspects of the Triple GI as a whole. Um, so, one of the first things we'll be working on again is standardization of what the aspects uh, are. What exactly is the steering group going to be? What are its responsibilities? What are its roles? Defining those things in a very clear way uh, that includes communications between the working groups. Um, and standardizing that, making sure that there's a process that can be followed so that uh, the steering group isn't this um, sort of a vague uh, group that's referred to but nobody really has any interaction with them. We very much want to make sure that the steering group uh, is seen to be accessible and also accountable to the members, especially since there are paying members of this organization. And um, uh, we'll also be refining the terms of reference for the steering group to make sure that that is clear as well and uh, also looking to the future. So we do know, as we've discussed before, there was some concern that uh, um, what happens when World Animal Protection steps down um, as the sort of providing, the, as the driver and providing the secretariat. And uh, that's one of the things that is very much uh, at the forefront um, starting now. We don't want to start that late. We want to get on that now and start planning for what that's going to look like. Uh, when that happens. So uh, it, it seems quite likely at this point that the Triple GI will need to become an independent organization of its own, uh, which means obviously there's going to be things involved with that. They'll have to be incorporated somewhere. Um, they'll have to have you know, own bylaws and potentially a board of directors and things like that. Uh, we're just looking at options. Nothing's finalized yet, but we are. I just want to make it clear that the steering group is very uh, focused on making sure that we have a plan moving forward and that we start on that plan now so that it's a smooth transition when that does occur uh, past 2017. Um, also, um, project approval will probably end up going through the steering group as uh, Rachel had mentioned. Um, so when we get the project review board uh, recommendations, then we'll go over that and try to talk about um, uh, final recommendations for projects that will move ahead with Triple GI support. Um, as, make, as Rachel also mentioned, um, that support might not necessarily be financial support right off the bat because uh, we don't have a, a big pool of money, as has been mentioned several times. Um, so it might just, be, uh, in, for some projects, it might be a letter of support. And given the uh, excellent work that this group and, and the working groups within it have been doing, uh, that's only going to improve. And I think the weight behind the Global Ghost Gear Initiative uh, when it comes to that, for other groups to seek funding will be will be quite uh, will be quite substantial. Um, now there comes the uh, magic funding question that a lot of people have uh, um, have raised, and that's something that the steering group is going to try to wrap its head around um, moving forward as well. Yet, yeah, to be honest, um, but we are working towards that to understand what 
uh, what the triple GI, uh, because again, we're here we are, uh, the triple GI is going to be a certain thing up until when World Animal Protection steps down, and after that it's going to be something uh, a little bit different. Uh, I think the work that the triple GI and the groups within it are going to be doing uh, will remain largely the same, but um, what is it going to look like for a funding source? We don't know that yet. These are things that uh, the steering group, however, is very uh, much committed to finding the answers to um, to see what what are the avenues for funding. Um, is it would it be something that the Triple GI as its own entity can apply for a funding pool for? We're not sure. Again, these are very vague ideas uh, that are being thrown around. But at the next meeting, some of these things will be discussed uh, more fully, and we do want to make sure that we do have. Uh, some, as I mentioned, accountability, transparency, and uh, to the rest of the members. So uh, there will probably be minutes of the steering group meetings, uh, condensed versions of them made available, and we'll come up with some sort of a, a mechanism uh, so that steering group uh, or anyone uh, that wants to contact the steering group for whatever reason, that there's a, a very defined way of doing that. So it's about communication and it's about uh, um, making sure that these processes are standardized and that everyone knows what their roles are. Um, and on that note, we're actually looking for, uh, I'm going to put it out to the membership here, I think uh, we're looking for two advisors. Currently there are five members of the steering committee um, and there are two open advisor positions. Uh, I think we're looking at um, maybe some financial uh, acumen in one of those roles and potentially some governance expertise um, to move forward with the uh, planning on how the Triple GI will develop from this point forward. Um, so if anybody is aware of anyone that might fit those roles that's outside the membership, that would uh, that would be good. Um, I think we're open to that. We're all, of course, going to look through our own circles as well, but I think the broader that net is cast, the more likely we are to, um, to get the right people. And uh, those two advisors need to be appointed by the steering committee at the same time and for the same duration. So we really do need two in order for uh, in order to make that work. Um, I think I'll leave it there in case anybody has any questions, but I did just want to comment and say that this webinar to me has been great. Uh, it's really good to have open communications between the working groups and to see what everybody has been up to in a more uh, formalized way and to actually get that communication between groups in a, uh, even if it's um, not necessarily a visual way, but an audio, uh, or sorry, an audio way. Um, so we can actually hear each other's voices and communicate in that way rather than just emails which tend to get lost. So uh, we're also looking at setting up some sort of a standard way um, to maybe group some of these conversations together to avoid some of the emails and stuff. And whether that's, um, that is uh, limited to the steering group or whether that turns into something more broadly, I can't say yet. Uh, but uh, we're looking at ways to facilitate communication and make things easier to make sure that everyone has access to the information easily. And uh, yeah, apart from that, I will open it up to questions. And uh, there may have been one or two things that I've missed. So if there's any other members of the steering group, I see Ingrid is here. And uh, I think a couple of others are here. Sorry, my screen is quite small. Um, feel free to, to step up and or uh, step in and speak up. Joel, thank you so much for presenting. Um, no that was amazing. Uh, you used transparency and communication, which I totally agree with, and you took the words out of my mouth in regards to the webinar. I think it's been fantastic, and we'll certainly be repeating this um, over 2017 more and more regularly. Um, if there's no questions for Joel, I think I'll bring it to a close, um, and thank you all for taking your time, and thank you to the presenters for presenting on their different areas of the Triple GI. It's been really fantastic, and thank you so much. I will be sending out a recording to the rest of the Triple GI participants who weren't able to make it, um, and I'll also be sending out a feedback form if there's anything you'd like to feedback about the webinar, how we could improve it, or topics that you would like to cover, or participant organizations that you would like to hear from. Um, and the last thing I need to say, even though it's a little early because it's only the 7th of December, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas in case I don't get to hear from you or speak to you beforehand. So thank you ever so much for joining and I hope you have a good rest of your day or evening wherever you might be in the world. Thanks Chris, or Belle, I should say. Sorry, <laughs> That's okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Take care everyone.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.